You're listening to Barbell Logic, the podcast where we talk about what it means to experience strength and how you can use simple, hard, and effective strategies in training and nutrition to improve your life. It starts with meeting you where you are right now and finding lasting solutions. Welcome to the show. Ahoy, Barbell Logic listeners. You are here at the Barbell Logic podcast with myself, the uh, Academy Director, Nikki Sims, our Director of Coach, our, uh, our Director of, wow, that's I'm the other Nikki. my mind. That's Nikki Berman. <laughs> Chief, Chief Experience <laughs> Officer. Or CXR. Chief Experience <laughs> Officer. It's okay. I don't know what I do half the time either. <laughs> and Doc... <laughs> Dr. Jonathan Sullivan, Doc Sully, uh, who has been a longtime friend of the podcast of uh, <laughs> give the, the wave, uh, who's been, I, I believe, on more than once uh, here on this podcast itself, but he's kind of a, uh, been a coach with us at Barbell Logic for a long time uh, and just a, a wealth of wisdom. Oh. So, yeah, wanted to thank you for joining. <laughs> Pleasure to be here, as always. Thank you for asking me. Yay. Two of my favorite so people we... in the whole world. How could I say uh-huh. no? Excited. That Aww. just made my day. Awesome. No, seriously. Oh my God. C- CJ and I both just like hugged ourselves <laughs> over that comment. <laughs> well, and the, the, the funny thing is, Sully, you and I have had so many like uh, <laughs> interesting conversations over the years, when, especially when it comes to the research literature and <clears throat> bullshit. Uh, but <laughs> one thing that has come up a lot recently is uh, uh, on the medical side of things, there's so much data. People can, you know, you can order a blood test. I, I saw recently a, a health influencer is now offering a for pay, not, you know, it's it's a retail product uh, to get your vitamin D levels and all these different things checked. And so you have a your your profile. And there's there's on the other hand, the risk of overdiagnosis, of overtesting. And as somebody who has been in, you know, acute surgery in in dealing with people, masters athletes who who probably have, you know, a significant number of conditions, but also if you poke and prod anywhere, you'll find something wrong, you know, according to some test. Uh, I'd love to start with that. Where do you, from a coach's perspective, knowing you've worn both hats, but from a coach's side of things, how do you help your client manage uh, over diagnosed like that over panic. Well, on the on the medical side of things, actually, uh, there's a certain limitation uh, to my ability to assist with that. Uh, people go, they see their doctor, they get their checkups, they do their primary care, and the doctor says, "Well, it's time for your PSA, or it's time for your mammogram, or it's time for your colonoscopy, or we need to check your blood lipids, or." whatever and um um there's i i yeah, i can't interfere in that that's not that's not my um that's not my business anymore um what i can do is when they come to me as they often do with some lab thing and say well they said my bun was off or they said my my creatinine clearance was off or my hemoglobin is down a point or whatever, or my PSA is elevated, something like that, they're going to ask me about the context for that. And, and, you know, should I be freaked out? And most of the time, the answer is no, you shouldn't be freaked out. Um, and most of the time, what I'll tell them is like, if you're asking me hypothetically, um, I, I don't think that this particular screening examination is very helpful. And that's what I have to say about a lot of screening exams. So if you look at the number needed to screen for a lot of these standard interventions that family practitioners and primary care providers do, the number needed to screen, the number needed to test to save one life is just astronomical. But the number needed to harm through overtesting and um, unnecessary procedures and just by scaring the sh** out, can I say sh**? Just by scaring the sh** out of the patient. Right. The number. Yeah. Right. So uh, the number needed to harm is not astronomical. Um, And um, I'm a doctor and I love my profession and um, I'm glad I did it. But the brutal fact of the matter is there's a lot of stuff that we do in primary care and preventative care and in terms of screening um, that doesn't really get us any traction. 
uh, on improving patients' lives or even the length of their lives. So, you know, that's it, it's a broad question, but a lot of times that's what I end up telling the patient. It's like, you know, you, you need to, what you need to do is ignore this and don't let your doctor, you know, stick something in you to confirm the test or to follow up on the test because it's not necessary. And I'll tell them that privately and off the record. Um, but for the most part, it's, I just don't see it as my job to have anything objective or formal to do with that process. Um, I have my own metrics that I'm going to use, my own indicators and my own care, the real health care that I'm doing in the gym. And that's that's where that's that's where I I, I think we're going to get to uh, before before we kind of get into that piece. I would love so you're you are you're a licensed doctor. You know you have that piece that many coaches don't have. So when a lifter goes to their primary care and they're they're on the schedule of normal preventative exams, okay, I'm I'm certainly not going to tell them anything. You know to turn them off to that. What I see a lot, I don't know if you see this in your population. What I get, and you know, Nikki, I, I don't know if you see it either, is is people who are like, oh, I read an article that or, or saw a tweet that. Everyone is is short on vitamin D, and there's this you know test that I can use to get my vitamin D uh, uh, sampled, or that I can use to oh I think my testosterone is low. I think this or that uh, based on you know I googled I feel tired, and the first five sponsored links are all web pages telling me that I need to get these tests. Uh, is there I'd l- I'd love to get into the the coaching side of things, and that's going to be, I think, the the most important part. But before we step off the the, med- is there any of those? Is there anything where you would even tell a client they come to you and go, I think like I think that this test uh, is this retail test has value. Do you pretty much turn them all off? You know, is that is that a usual usually a no for you a default no? Um, I, yeah, I would have to say so, and I, I, in a way, I'm kind of ashamed to say that. So I do have sort of a default mode um, because of a long exposure to like real tests in medicine that people would actually get to help them or to ostensibly help them make better clinical decisions. Most of the time, when doctors test, they're not doing it to make better clinical decisions; they're just getting it because. That's the test that you get, um, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, and I spent my whole career trying to, I was a little bit of an outsider, I spent my whole career trying to tell residents and medical students, you know, who told me, like, I think we should get a CBC, and I say, what are you going to do with it? Right. Do you know what you're going to do with that result when you get it? So when somebody comes to me with one of these like retail tests or something like that, or, you know, maybe I should get a calcium score or, um, you know, maybe I should get my vitamin D level checked or whatever. Or a DEXA scan. Uh, my first question is, oh, right, my first question is going to be why? Why are you going to do that? Um, and what are you going to do differently when you right. get the result, right? So really the client uh, is in the same patient or the same uh, place, I think, as the doctor should be. Like, I have this test that's available to me. What am I going to do with it? Can I just veer off real quick and tell you, like, this is how I spent my entire career thinking. A patient would come in and they would have some problem. They had a problem. They had a complaint. They didn't just come into the ER just for the ambiance because they because <laughs> couldn't tell the difference between the ER and the piano bar, music, right? Uh, so uh, they came in because they had a problem. So you evaluated their problem. You did a history and physical examination, took three minutes, right? And you did a focused physical exam in history. And then you said, um, what are all the things that could be wrong with this patient? And because you're an ER doc, which means you're like really kind of crazy, uh, you would think of the worst things first. Like, what is going to kill this patient with this presentation in the next 30 minutes, right? And and then what are what's all the other also-ran stuff? And then you, and what I would tell residents and, and medical students would be like, now what you have to do is now that you've generated that worst first differential diagnosis of the things that could be going on, it's your job to use your doctor brain to rule all that stuff out, Right? With your doctor brain, this is the test you're really going to do. You're going to use this to say, 
this is not a pulmonary embolus. The patient's not short of breath, has no risk factors, no tachycardia. No, this is not an aortic dissection. The patient doesn't have ripping pain. There's no pulse deficits. His pain's not severe enough. He doesn't have any risk factors. He's too young. He's not hypertensive. No, All right? It's not zero risk, but the risk is not worth pursuing. I'm going to rule that out with my doctor brain. Next item, right? It's not Borhoff syndrome. He doesn't have a ruptured esophagus. And you're going to work to, until you run into something It's like, I cannot use my doctor brain to rule out an acute coronary syndrome in this patient. My doctor brain alone won't do that. I know that from my own experience in the literature. So now it's time to get a test that will help me make the next decision I need to make about this patient with regards to an acute coronary syndrome. See what I'm saying? I'm going to use my, my doctor brain, or in the case of coaching, my coach's brain, to rule stuff out until I can't rule something out just with my brain and my clinical experience and my, ra and my rationality, now I have to get a test. See what I'm saying? And because I approached it that way, I know exactly what that test is for. I know exactly what I'm going to do with that result. Does that make sense? That's the correct approach. Yeah. Um, what people will call a Bayesian approach. So I have a pretest probability now that this is acute coronary syndrome. I'm going to say this is a low test, a low probability patient, but I can't rule it out with my brain and the risk is high if I miss it. So I'm going to get this test. And that test is going to confirm either that this is a low probability patient or it's going to disconfirm that. And that's going to change what I do. That's the, that's the proper cognitive approach that doctors should bring to healthcare in patients who have a complaint. Of course, it's a little bit different when patients don't have a complaint, when you're just doing primary, like preventative medicine, it's like, well, we should screen you and make sure that you don't have a bad thing that happens to people sometimes. So we're going to do this test and see if you have a bad thing that happens to people sometimes. It turns out that those kinds of things just don't work very well. Yeah, um, it like yeah. creates this kind of feeling that you have that you're sick until you're proven healthy and you almost secretly want them to prove that you're sick. Perfect. That's a perfect way. That's a perfect mm. way to verbalize the problem, right? And so, and and so you're a patient, aren't you? Right? There, right. You you feel fine, right? But you're fifty something years old. So now mm -hmm. you're a patient because you have to have a mammogram, you have to have a colonoscopy, you have to have a PSA, you have to have this, you have to have regular checkups, which, by the way, have never been shown to reduce mortality in any population. What? Seriously. You want, you want a great resource for your listeners? There's a great site called thennt.org. T-H-E-N-N-T dot org. And if you want some eye openers, go to that site. NNT stands for Number Needed to Treat. The Number Needed oh, cool. to Treat dot org. And you can go up there and look up all kinds of interventions and tests and see how many people do you need to treat to get a be one better outcome? And how many people do you need to treat or test to get one harm? Right? And then you look at those two numbers and that really helps you get some clarity on what it is exactly that you're doing. And most like, of the time, the NNT is not good for most <laughs> of the things that we do. Like insurance companies and hospitals are fitness influencers that have more <laughs> official titles. <laughs> mm. Right. And right. they get paid a lot more. <laughs> so you made, you made a really, what I think, what I think was kind of a, you know, galaxy brain uh, connection for me in terms of coaching and being a doctor. Uh, not that we are licensed professionals in that way, like that's not that's not where I'm going, but instead the process when you run into an obstacle, you run into a problem. My lifter is, uh, is uh, everything else is okay, but then their normal performance at high intensity circuits has all of a sudden, uh, you know, since the last time we did them, gone absolutely through the floor and it doesn't make any sense. And then as a coach, I'm trying to diagnose, is it not enough stress? Is it too much stress? Are they over, you know, are they, are they uh, under recovered? Are they uh, going down that list, trying to scratch things out? And that's where I think often uh, coaches miss the opportunity to, to really dig deep or refer out. So you mentioned earlier that there are things that you look for as a coach. You're looking at your, your lifter's performance and, Oftentimes, 
uh, there are uh, realizations, opportunities. Like this is a sign that something's wrong. Right. So uh, can we let's let's start with that for a little bit. As a coach, where are you? What do you see that that triggers you that something needs to change? That something is not just add reps, subtract reps. You know, uh, get more sleep, get more protein. Well, those those are important considerations. So a sudden a sudden decline in a sudden unexplained decline in performance, despite the the program uh, being rational and the lifter being consistent and all of that. So a sudden decline in performance is is you know sort of the equivalent of what in adult or pediatric medicine you might call a, a failure to thrive, right? So failure to thrive is a presentation that requires an evaluation and workup. Well, a failure to progress or a failure to thrive in the gym, that's a you know that's a presentation that re requires interrogation, uh, pain. Obviously, you know people have pain. It, all of a sudden, they have shoulder pain. They have back pain, um, uh, um, or God forbid, they have headache or chest pain or abdominal pain uh, under the bar, right? So, um, or um, they. Um, they all of a sudden have a, a, a lack of consistency. All of a sudden, they start missing every other workout. Well, that's actually a, a presentation that requires interrogation, and not for commercial reasons. Like, why are you missing every other workout? What's going on in your life kind of thing. So, um, the, uh, focal weakness, um, uh, and all kinds of things, like discoloration. Of an extremity of a, of a of a member or deformity of a member or um, anything like that. So, like you name it, there's like a million presentations. Especially when you work with my population, you're going to see a, a lot of uh, a lot of different things. So, um, what you have to do is you have to interrogate those as a coach. And yeah, it helps to have some knowledge as a physician. But I will tell you, I'm going to make a big confession here to you guys. Right now, um, when it comes to musculoskeletal medicine, orthopedic medicine, physical medicine, I'm not your guy. I'm doctor stroke, heart attack, gunshot wound, appendicitis, septic shock. That's me. I'm that guy. When it comes to, you know, somebody comes to me with knee pain, right? I do an examination. I make sure they don't have an unstable knee or a neurovascular problem. If I suspect a fracture on my Bayesian analysis, I can't rule it out with my doctor brain. I get an x-ray, no fracture. I wrap the knee up. I send them home, and the discharge diagnosis is internal derangement of the knee, meaning I have no clue what's wrong with your knee, and I don't care because it's not an emergency. I'm sending you home, right? As a coach, you have to be more circumspect, right? Because it turns out that knees are important in the gym. Right. And um, uh, uh, so you guys probably know some some of that stuff, at least as well as I do, because you're coaches. Right. And 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 because you hang out with like Burgos and Will Morris and all those kind of guys. Right. You're right. You so you know things and you do your homework. You go and you you check stuff out and you've been through it before. So. I'm no better at musculoskeletal medicine than most of the really fine coaches I know, and you are both really fine coaches. So um, then, then it just becomes not not using your doctor brain, but using your coaching brain and knowing the differential diagnosis for acute knee pain in in the gym and knowing the differential diagnosis for acute shoulder pain in the gym and knowing your red flag diagnoses. Right. So there are some and CJ, you and I have talked about this before. I think we did an article on it. Right. Um, yeah. About about red flag diagnosis. You've got to know what the red flags are. Right. If people are looking for that, it's called How Not to Totally Suck as a Coach. It's on the website, the Barbell Logic website. And you can pull out a list that uh, we work together, me and Sully, on, on you know, th things that are from, from that emergency perspective yeah. of like that 30 second, that two hour, that one day, like, pew, yeah. that's, that's I, where and that I is. Think, I think we did a, a good job on that. But um, and then so uh, really what you have to do is you just have to interrogate the situation. So the patient says, um, I have knee pain. And you uh, you say, okay, stop, uh, rack the bar. Uh, like say you have knee pain during the squat. You like, show me your knee. Why don't you look at the damn knee, coach? Look at the knee 
If your patient's not squishy about it, feel the knee. You should know what a knee feels like. You're a coach. You should know what a knee looks like. You're a coach. Check the range of motion. Ask the, if you don't see anything hinky, right? Obviously, if the blood is shooting out or the knee is all of a sudden very swollen or deformed in some way, that that's different, right? But look at the knee and then ask the patient to do an air squat or just bend the knee. Does that hurt? No. Okay. Do a couple more air squats. Okay. Take some weight off the bar. Do a single. Did that hurt? No. Is it hurting now? No. No deformity. No obvious injury. No instability. The patient doesn't have numbness or tingling. Nothing else feels weird. The pain went away. They're able to squat painlessly at a lower weight. Put the weight back on the bar. Have them do another single. Painless? Yeah. All right. We're done. We're going to ignore that now, right? You all have done this hundreds of times. That's a classic sort of Bayesian approach to the situation. That's a very medical approach. But say now the patient still has pain. The pain's getting worse. Now you have to generate at, at least a sort of a coaching differential of what's going on. And you're at the top of your coaching differential is going to be <laughs> an internal derangement of the knee, right? Uh, so, I have no idea what's going on. Here. I have no idea what's going on there. Uh, it still hurts. It's limiting their movement, right? So now you have to ask yourself, what is your approach going to be? Is this a high-risk patient or a low-risk patient? You're going to engage in some shared decision-making with your client, right? You're, if they're not like a really acute, if the pain's not catastrophic, it's just bugging them, it suddenly started while they were squatting, right? They're not like, like, ah, oh, God, I can't stand it, right? If there's a, like, ah, oh, God, I can't stand it, what are you going to do? You know what you're going to do. You're going to refer. You're going to refer out. You're going to send them to a, acute care, physical medicine, urgent care, or something like that for an x-ray or, an, or at least a proper examination that you're not really necessarily qualified to do. You did your coaching exam. Now they need a medical exam, right? You're going to refer out, right? But and we've all done this a, a thousand times, right? They're okay. They can't squat on it. Huh? See if they can deadlift on it. Seriously, right? <laughs> See if they can do presses on it. See if they can push the prowler on it, right? Same thing with, with back injury, right? You're going to have, and every coach should have, and you know maybe we need to work on this, CJ. Every coach should have like a regional approach, right? So because the way you're going to approach uh, an acute shoulder is might be a little bit different from the way you're going to approach an acute hip. And the way you approach an acute hip might be a little bit different in Nikki than in me. Because I have like, I'm like 60 years older than Nikki, right? I have so a you're very gonna make, cute hip. Yeah, you're going to, right, right, <laughs> right. You don't want anything to happen at that hip. Um, so, so. I hope that makes sense. Is that what you're looking for? Because I'm just sort of like blathering on. Well, I think and I'm not sure it's what you what you want. I'm I'm hearing like you know 30 different threads that I could pull on. So this is fantastic. All right. And uh, when you talk about collaborating with your play, uh, patient and having a negotiation with them, I remember a few a few podcasts ago, Nikki and I, when I interviewed you about your back pain. When I interviewed you about your back pain, and uh, that was very much. Like that's that was really what I was hearing at the at the level from the client's perspective about uh, how to negotiate this this kind of pain, this struggle. Yeah, I've been like I'm thinking about how to use coach brain versus doctor brain and like with a coach brain, we have tests too, like you just described, like let's change the range of motion, let's change the form, let's take a look, unloaded. And interestingly, it seems like our tests are also like the dosages that we can use to treat. It's like, okay, well, exact yeah. like if this range of motion isn't working or really firstly, if this weight isn't working, if the form isn't right, then we get to change that. So we not, we get to use like all of those things in two really useful ways where it's our tools would be form, make sure they're doing it properly. Weight, you move that up and down as you need to change the range of motion up and down as you need to and monitor the frequency. Maybe it's their fourth day in the gym and they were just hiking that's a lot of frequency on the knee and yeah. maybe that's a variable that can be manipulated as well so it's like our variables are also our our tests and our for our coach brains that's so a box that's squat excellent. is it that's actually excellent that's another thread for you to pull on right there that are yeah that are uh dosing metrics for the prescription that we're using or uh, uh, you know we can we can use those those same things as as diagnostic metrics, interrogation metrics for an acute presentation. Metrics. 
Yeah, because a box squat is is in some ways a test. Sure. It's like, do you feel so? You you're hurting during a squat, during a box squat. Let's give that a try. Huh? You're not hurting anymore. Now, do I really know at like the 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 tissue level what that tells me about the knee? I don't feel comfortable saying that I do. I don't feel like I know the fact that you can do a box squat allows me to diagnose your internal derangement at the knee. Right. Uh, there's still a black box going into my head, but A, they have information that could be presented to a MSK specialist provider if they need to about the ranges of motion and the types of movement that are available exactly. to them without pain. And we now have something that we can continue to do. Exactly. We can keep training them in the box squat now. Yeah, we have such a great advantage being their coaches. We get to see them regularly. We get to retest and retest and retest and mm. check in with them really frequently, which isn't something that most get to do. We get to interact with them on such a regular basis that we can see trends and we can respond in the moment and manipulate each variable each time. I was, if I, if I could, so I'd like to share a story with you, uh, in, in an example of how a training log kind of came in handy, or at least a life log in my case, because I know you care a lot about training logs and what information that tells you about a client, about a, a lifter's presentation. I, I, I like that idea of, of, you know, things that we often see as just mistakes or noncompliance. No, that's a presentation mm -hmm. that's of a of an right. issue. Like that. Maybe it's a, a social or environmental or a physical issue. But uh, so I was uh, I was experiencing like I really didn't have any clear and hard symptoms that anything was wrong. But I was noticing that most of my aerobic work, which I had been ramping up, was in low intensity zone. When I would go into high intensities, like very high intensities, I'm trying to sustain the most that I can for 40 minutes. Uh, my performance was through the floor. Like I'm dying. Like breath is just out. And for the first week, I'm telling myself, I'm just not used to this. I haven't been doing that style of work for a long time. Two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months where these workouts are continuing to suck wind. And as a coach, uh, well, and at the same time, I'm, I'm starting to think something is wrong. And at the same time, I go to donate blood and I'm anemic. At least I don't, I don't meet the criteria to donate blood. So I go and we find out and I collect all the hemoglobin and all the hematocrit numbers and all that from all of my previous donations. And it turns out after talking to an endocrinologist and some other stuff that uh, the anemia was caused by donating blood which happens to some people they just don't replace uh they just uh, they replace red blood cells but not the uh not the iron quickly enough if they're not supplementing. So I started supplementing on the doctor's orders, slowed down my, you know, my frequency of donation, boom. Those high frequency exercise like workouts started feeling like they used to. They still sucked, <laughs> but I'm not dying. Man, that really speaks to how important it is to engage in regular activity that has some sort of consistency to it. Because the workout is itself, yeah, signal of how your body's working. And I would never have known if I wasn't moving with high intensity because my strength work, it didn't require, you know, high end oxygen transfer. <laughs> Neither did low intensity uh, uh, running or rowing. Like that was not a limiting factor that would have been discovered. Uh, so for me, that turned out to be a useful time when I could look at my training log and say, my performance hit the tank here. And then when I got through my medical training logs, when I went through uh, my donation histories and looked at the, the blood metrics, and I could see, oh, like, uh, there was a clear decline, and this is where my, where my hematocrit, my hemoglobin were at at that point. When you train athletes, what do you have them put in their training log so that you're more likely to catch that kind of thing? And what kind of things do you catch? Well, because I know you do. Yeah, I do catch things. Um, uh, actually, um, I, tr I have tried many, many times to get people to log subjective stuff. And some of my athletes are very good about that. They log their body weight. Uh, they log subjective things like feeling good, feeling bad. They log stuff about what their most recent uh, um, adventures and misadventures are, family trips, um, overall feeling good, sleep, right? Most of my clients are just not assiduous about this. And, um, 
And, you know, I just, I leave that to them. It's, it's like, you're not really like if your doctor asks you to log something, yeah, most clients won't, most patients won't log stuff. Um, I ask my clients to, to track their macronutrients and stuff, but a lot of the really serious ones do and some don't. And, um, I just, I, I just don't have the, the temporal, uh, or attentive resources to make sure everyone's logging all that stuff every time. Now we have thought in the past about going to some sort of, um, electronic log that, or something like turnkey coach, perhaps something that requires the client to log that kind of stuff. Um, mm. uh, we just haven't made that transition yet. Um, however, uh, it is pretty easy if they'll just log a few things like obviously their workout, how they subjectively feel, what their current body weight is, um, and, um, and their sleep. Like just that those few things will help me out a lot. Um, my client, John Clausen, um, he, you know, he walks in my 96 year old, he just turned 96. He walks in the door. What do I get? I get his sleep. I get his body weight. I get his recent nutrition. I get his overall subjective feeling of how he feels. So he lets me know. Right. And, um, and all of that and, you know, his latest misadventures. And, and actually what I've discovered is, is that the older clients tend to be the ones who are most you know, assiduous, uh, about all of this. Mm. So, yeah. um, but if you, but you can really just, again, it's the same problem that you have in medicine. What was this, um, paper, uh, that I was looking at, um, last. I love that Sully is just has papers. It just happens to have <laughs> right? it at hand, like this right is, here. There's a paper. Why metrics overload is bad medicine. Ooh. Right. Mm. Written like by a, a doctor, a Harvard, um, Victoria McAvoy, Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Med School, who has like, who is tired of their shit, right, with the metrics, because the metrics are just proliferating madly, right? And most of these metrics that she's required to report don't help her make better decisions. Well, you could do the same thing as a coach. You could say, okay, I want your body weight. I want your fat grams. I want your, your last cholesterol. I want your last bone mineral density. I want your number of hours of sleep. How many times did you have to get up from bed to pee? How much sex have you had in the last month? Um, and so on, right? Well, you know, you can just, you can really go down a rabbit hole with that stuff. If you just, if you just log what you're lifting, your prowler pushes, um, your active rest. Uh, I don't ask clients about sex, but your sleep and uh, your overall feeling of well-being. That's going to take me a long way. And plus, you're just going to tell me if something that like, hey, Sully, I've got this swelling or hey, Sully, I've got this rash. So can I, I, I can tell you um, uh, I had two stories, but oh, uh, I can tell you a story. Right. So um, I have a client who um, had diabetes. He has diabetes. Right? He has type two diabetes, um, an older gentleman, very nice man. And um, and he had the diabetic neuropathy to go with it. So, in fact, uh, coaching him is a little bit of a uh, of a challenge. Um, he's a wonderful client, but he can't feel his feet. His feet feel like two big pillows because of his diabetic neuropathy, Ooh. which is relatively advanced um, under some control. But right. And then he started to develop neuropathy in his, he, you know, what he said, his hands. It's like, yeah, it's like my hands are getting weaker and clumsier and, and uh, you know, all that. And especially, you know, my, I think it was my right. My right hand's just getting, and it's like this neuropathy is out of control. I'm like, okay, that's, that sucks. What have they got you on? And I asked him about his medicines and all this kind of stuff, right? And then one day he's complaining about it and just shows to go you, right? And I'm thinking, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know you've got diabetic neuropathy. And, and he says, and, and my tit is disappearing. You know, it's like I got no pectoral muscle anymore. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, um, what did you f say? Wait. What did you say? Right. And uh, within two weeks, we had him under a neurosurgeon's knife for spinal cord compression in his oh, wow. high cervical spine. Oh, and, uh, apparently, the neurosurgeon, when he did the laminectomy, the, the cord just kind of kind of puffed out and turned pink right before his eyes. That guy had literally days um, before he developed permanent paralysis. Jeez, man. And uh, yeah, it was, it was kind and of, it sounds like it, kind of horrifying. In that case, Sully, part of it was just 
paying attention because yeah. I, I could hear you. I could even hear you while you're talking about it. You're like, yeah, 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 yeah. I've heard that. We've all, I've done, heard we've that. all been there, right? So you got to, you, 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 you got to listen and, 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 and you got to listen for red flags. And that's why our listeners who are coaches and, and your other listeners, they, we, people should know what the red flags are. Like everybody gets back pain, right? When should you be concerned? Because sometimes almost always back pain is just benign. It's just, I mean, it doesn't seem benign to you. I've just been through a flare-up, right? For a month, I couldn't squat, deadlift. And it's just the same place. I've always had it, which is another story. And uh, and it, it's getting better now. It didn't feel benign to me, but I knew it was just, it's just benign, mechanical, low back pain, right? But there are red flags that go with back pain. And if you're a responsible professional, fitness professional, you know what those red flags are. Go to the article that CJ and I wrote and we'll tell you what they are, right? You got to know the presentations that, that indicate either further interrogation and or referral. You've got to know what those things are, right? And when in doubt, just refer. So what? Well, I mean, you know, um, actually, one of, the, one of the wisest things I ever heard was from uh, Jim Wendler, who is an irascible dude. Uh, but I was on a panel with him, panel with him once, uh, an interesting fellow, and we were asked this question about, about back pain. What do you do? And he said, I just send them out. He's like, I just tell them to go see their doctor. Like, I, like, I don't even want to get into that, right? If you're going to come up to me and bitch about your back pain, I'm going to send you home. That was, you know, I'm not quite so irascible or indiscriminate in my approach to back pain, but it's actually pretty wise, right? Just like as a physician, if you have to stand there and wring your hands about whether or not you're going to get that test, just get the f-ing test, right? You haven't been able to rule it out with your doctor brain. You haven't been able to rule out a bad thing with your coach brain. So just refer. And that doesn't mean you have to stop the session. It just means you have to like, okay, well, let's stop doing that exercise. Push the prowler, go see the sports med guy. And if you're a coach and you don't have a house sports med guy, like sort of on informal staff, like we do at Grace, so we have a sports med guy. We love him, right? We're sending his kids through college, right? Because all my patients, all my all my clients go to him when they have something that I can't deal with in, in, in the gym, right? You should have that guy that who understands what you do, right? And when you send him a little old lady or a bro, he doesn't say, well, here's your problem. You're lifting all these heavy weights. He's like, he's going to, he's like, let's get you back under the bar, right? You need to have that guy out there. So again, I'm just sort of free associating, but I, I hope that's helpful. And, you know, that's the way I think about it. I'm Jan. There's, there's a lot. <laughs> that's there's a, a nice, lot to pull from there. That's a no. nice way of saying I've got an unfocused answer, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Cause I was, there was, there were so many things I was pulling from that. And one in particular, like you mentioned the red flags, uh, you mentioned the subjective metric. Because Nikki, when when I was interviewing Nikki about her back pain, one of the things you talked about, Nikki, was uh, when the gym really started sucking, when it really started becoming a grind and you didn't want to do it and it felt like a burden to go out and do it. Uh, and in some ways, that's like, that's something I have to fix is the mindset. But flip it, maybe, that's something that's signaling something's wrong. Like that, that is a metric that matters. That is a clinical, in terms of, that is that a is a clinical sign. That is a presentation and it has to be interrogated. And your job yeah. as a good professional coach is to interrogate that presentation and generate a differential diagnosis with your coaching brain, right? Rule things in or out with your coaching brain. And if you're in over your head, refer. Maybe you're anemic, right? <laughs> so, uh, 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 so, or something else. Right? Maybe you're overtrained, and a, and a review of the right. log will, will will show that. Right? So, yeah. I was chuckling a minute ago, thinking of or when you said the metrics that are that you need to have in your log that work really well, are like body weight, how you're feeling that day, sleep. And I just recorded a podcast with Matt yesterday where he went over like 30 metrics that he keeps <laughs> logs of like daily. So just our listeners, when you when you hear one before the other, just uh, choose who you want to listen to. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, and different people are going to have different approaches. So um, yeah. I was the I was the guy in the ER who didn't order a lot of tests, which, by the way, meant that I got paid less. 
I got fewer relative value units to get oh, wow. paid by, right? So the system, at least when I left a few years ago, the system continued to reward the doctor who got the most tests. That is a highly corrupting That's influence. That's really ridiculous. But just from an intellectual perspective and from the perspective, like, like, why would I wait for a test that's not going to change what I do while I've got other patients coming in? It's just not efficient. So I was the guy who just did not get a lot of tests, right? And if, if there's another correlation between coaching and medical practice, uh, and maybe not to get off on this tangent for long, but there is also that incentive for coaches too, like uh, a functional movement screen, yeah. a, you know, a Z movement screen, a, a pattern analysis. I'm going which, to offer which plays a... plays into this whole thing, CJ. I, po I shared one of your reels uh, to my story this morning on IG, the one where, like, like do we need coaches? And that's a, that's a way to convince your clients that they need you, right? Because there's all these tests that you can do, just like the doctor has all these tests that he wants you to do and to take. Most of which can, not all, but like, for example, colonoscopy appears to save lives, right? But has anybody ever prescribed a better program for somebody based on their functional movement screen? Ever? <laughs> well... That I think people zero times. <laughs> I think people like the re like to be reassured that it's okay if they don't try very hard, and it's safer <laughs> that you don't try very hard right now because your functional movement screening is deficient. And it's like yeah. they look for this like way out through these special tests and screenings, and it just allows them to you know put trying hard in the back seat. And there's but, an incentive structure to the coach to give them a way absolutely. out too. Yeah, because if I'm running into <laughs> if I'm running into a plateau, like my lifter's not making progress, and I give them a a test, like oh we're going to the moving screen, but there's honestly many uh, available options out there, and the test shows one in the red. You know, whatever the items are, one is in the red. Well, that must be the problem, right? So right. we get to back off. We get to focus on whatever this metric is. I'm going to continue to get paid as a coach. And we have a valid excuse for why you're not making progress. Right. That's not uh, me. I Yeah, that's not me. <laughs> that's not yeah. the, so the, our the, the answer is them, you're broken. We've just right. lowered our expectations yeah, the of answer them. Is, on, perhaps is exactly unfairly. right. The answer is you're broken. That's why you can't make progress. You have hypofunctional movement screenosis, right? And, <laughs> and, the, and it's incurable. Uh, uh, we're doing everything we can do. And, and it's just, it's just, bull mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just bullshit. But, um, yeah. two other things I wanted to give that I wanted to, little anecdotes that I wanted to tell you, right. It, it, to the extent that this helps, I have a, a, a wonderful client, a guy who had, uh, multiple strokes, um, and, uh, who's just really blossomed at Gray Steel. And then he comes in one day and he's limping. And, uh, I'm like, what happened? He's like, oh, I hurt my foot. I'm like, okay, well, and I'm busy. I'm trying to like, right. Um, and, um, I'm like, okay, well, uh, are you okay? Can you, can you squat? He's like, yeah. I'm like, okay. And he doesn't have that much of a limp. He does a squat. He warms up. He does a couple of sets and now he's really limping. I'm like, are you okay? I'm like, he's like, yeah, I'm okay. I'm like, show me your foot, man. <laughs> and he shows me his foot and it's just black and blue and swollen. I'm like, what'd you do? He's like, oh, I dropped an engine block on it. I'm like, damn it. Were you going to share that at some point? <laughs> <laughs> go to, you got to, you got to go to urgent care. He's like, okay. And he starts loading his bar. I said, no, I mean now, dude, you got to go now. Right. So, he, so like, are there a, people that like, they suffer a stroke and they're just like, ah, everything's fine after a stroke. And then others who are like, no, I had no, a stroke, actually, I can't do anything. He's about. actually a very <laughs> sensible guy. I think what was happening was after training with us, for, for several months, he just started to feel kind of exuberant. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, um, and so he had a Liz Frank fracture. And unfortunately, he's at home with screws in his foot right now. Oh, man. Bummer. It also goes to show that, like, clients, one of the values that we bring as coaches is providing some perspective on both ends. Usually it feels <laughs> like we're pushing a little bit. Like, it, it, that's just a tweak. You'll be fine. But sometimes you get the client. Uh, there's a, a guy on the Internet, Dr. Glaucon Fleck, and he does comic sketches. I and he has one about Glaucon Fleck. He is awesome. <laughs> you got to check great. him out. <laughs> 
And he asked he's one right about on, the, the. By the way, he's right on. I come from that culture, and I am telling you, that dude is right on. You want a real Who peek inside How do you spell it? Welcome, felt. <laughs> if you want a real peek in the way medicine is, <laughs> you go check out this guy's reels. Awesome. Hilarious. <laughs> he has one of, with the rur- the rural medicine doctor is dealing with a farmer, and coaches will say like, "Oh, if it's really serious, my client will let me know." And sometimes it's not like in this particular one. It's funny because like the farmer dig. is, you know, is it, the fact that the farmer even shows up at the rural medicine doctor's, you know, place for treatment is immediate red flags. Everyone at the place like goes, dude, dude, like we got to go because the 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 client is is some clients are less likely to respond. So we have to put that in context when sometimes people don't. Sometimes yeah. people drop an engine block in their foot and they're just like, eh, and, I'm okay. yeah, and you got to dig. You gotta yeah. dig. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm angry with myself that I didn't like. I, I mean, you can't do it every time, though, right? You're not gonna like everybody who comes in and says my foot hurts. You're not gonna like undress them and look at their foot as a coach. You're just, you're not gonna do that. Um, but you know, that's so. But you're gonna, your antenna are gonna go up, and you're gonna look for other signs, indications that you need to to dig and then when it's time to dig you're going to dig and when you find something that's outside your wheelhouse and outside your experience and outside your expertise you're just going to refer just refer what's the you know and and so then the only question becomes do i refer right now no dude you've got to go to urgent care right now right uh no we're going to call 911 we've done that right um or are you going to say you know what push the prowler and make an appointment with our guy right um that's the only question at that point is like, do you need the test urgently? Can it be done outpatient vis-a-vis the gym or inpatient? And then one more thing I want to tell you guys is a conversation I actually had with our guy this morning, our, our house doctor. Um, for the back pain, he finally talked me into getting an, an MRI. How did he sway you into it? Oh, sorry. He said, you uh, he said, you know, uh, it's been bugging you for decades. I'm like, I, I can't think of a better reason not to get an MRI. He's like, yeah, but you know, uh, like if the shit ever hits the fan, we'll have a baseline. We'll know where you are today and you are over 50. So there are like evil things that present as back pain, even though it's the same back pain you've always had. It's like there, there are evil things that happen in older guys. So let's just do it. I'm like, fine. Like, I trust you. Uh, we we'll get it. So I got the MRI. He calls me this morning and he says, uh, you got a moment to talk about this MRI? I'm like, do we need to talk about it? Right. Does it show an unstable orthopedic injury, an acute neurosurgical process or something neoplastic like a cancer? Right. He's like, nope. I'm like, do we need to po- talk about it? And he's like, absolutely. We don't have to talk about it. It's like, is it going to change what I do? He said, no, it's not going to change what you do. You need to just keep doing what you're doing. I'm like, are we done? He said, yeah, we're done. I'm like, I don't want to know my anatomy. He's like, I totally get it. I wish more of my patients were like that, right? So (laughs) seriously, like when I'm under the bar, I don't want to be thinking about my anatomy. No. I want to just be thinking about about my movement. So I don't need that. He may want that test, but it's not going to change what I do. You got to understand what's going to help you make better decisions and and what isn't. That was always in my head when people would ask if, if I was going to get an MRI. And I was like, I can't even imagine how that would change what I'm doing right now. I'm adjusting weights. I'm adjusting frequency. I'm adjusting load. Like, what else am I going to do differently? I've modified right. everything. <laughs> assuming that, <laughs> assuming that, you, that you don't have any red flags. Right. right? right. Assuming that yeah. you don't have the red flags. So coaches, coaches you got to know the red flags. Yeah. You've got to know the red flags. Yeah, we'll be sure to link to that article when we share this episode. That'll be good. Yeah, we'll definitely get that in the show notes. I think there's a there's a really important part to, part of that story too. Like you deferred to his advice and his recommendation to get the MRI in the first place. That doesn't mean that you just coast and do everything he says from that point on. At every step, you are in charge of you know your body, your part in the in the process and like can ask smart questions. It's like, okay, you've convinced me I need an MRI. Do And then when it comes to reviewing the results, do we need to review the results or can we just store them? No, okay. Like at each step, 
We don't have to exactly. give away give away our responsibility to ask questions, to clarify, to get better answers, to get a second opinion. Um, and we can recognize their expertise and the, the maintain our reasonable... autonomy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that honestly, uh, if there's a position for a client and a coach, because the coach is in the same way, like we have an autonomous uh, position that we relate to our client, like I can tell you to do something, I can use you, I can suggest you, and then it's your opinion, it's your position whether you're going to do it or not. That is, uh, if anything, I think a great place to end it on. It's on where what we call shared decision making. Yeah, that sounds nice. <laughs> it's one piece of, you know, when we talk about client centered, you know, client centered uh, coaching for life, for quality of life and for, you know, the course of a lifespan, part of that client centered is letting them own, you know, the decisions for for what matters. Well, I were to thank you so summarize up. Oh, sorry, can I? I want yeah, to summarize this and Sorry. See if it makes sense. <laughs> I it sounds like it's important to write certain things down. Write things down when you feel totally fine because it helps you get a vision of what air quotes normal is. And it allows you to spot things that are suddenly or slowly abnormal. And I would say that it's also important when you're collecting metrics is separate your emotions to some extent. And like you said a few times in this that I also really agree with is by tracking that metric and seeing changes, how would it influence your behavior? Is it going to change any behavior at all that you're willing to, or that you even need to? Exactly. And then lastly, I'd like to reinforce that sometimes, or I think people can hoard information from their coach or they'll just won't share information with their coaches. And I think it's for fear that something will have to be changed, that their future is going to have to be different. The future that they've imagined for themselves as a lifter is going to be taken away from them. But I think it's important to know that a good coach will always have a way to keep coaching you. There will always be a way that we can change this. And by keeping everybody informed, then we can make better decisions. So I think it's when there's something going on, it's okay to talk about it. It's not like you're going to be out of the game for ages. There's always a way that we can modify. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> he drops awesome. the mic. Well, that was really helpful. Thank you. It's I been love a blast. you guys. Thanks so much, Sully, for coming on board. And uh, huh? yeah, thank you we'll so much for being here. All right. All right. Take care, guys. <laughs>